Welcome. It's good to see you this lovely Lord's Day morning. Welcome to Lewis Lake, and we're glad that you could join us. And uh, we're just enjoying the... We don't get too many really, really nice days, and so this is one of them. We'll take it. We'll take it. The bugs are coming out, though, so yay for that. Anyway, hope you're doing well. Um, <laughs> 2020 is over halfway done. Aren't you so glad? <laughs> oh, goodness. Maybe it'll be better soon. Strange days we live in. Let me throw some announcements at you that will help you make, uh, hopefully help you uh, feel a little bit more normal. We're, we got some normal things coming up. Looking forward to Sunday school starting in a couple weeks. And so that's going to begin on September 13th. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And then we're going to eat together afterwards. So Because we do nothing meaningful unless we eat. So we're going to do something meaningful and then eat. And it's going to be wonderful. So... Um, and sign-up sheets are back, so yay, we're, we're, so sign up for something to bring so that we don't get, um, we want to make sure we have enough meatballs, right, and not too much mushroom dishes and that sort of thing, so, so there's sign-up there's sign sheets down there uh, for all that stuff, so uh, if, if you would avail yourself of that, that would be great. Um, one of the things that we had to uh, put off earlier on in the year was our concert, and so we're looking forward to having that. That's going to happen September 26th, Lord willing, that is scheduled to happen. Uh, so, so here's the way this is working. Um, we're not making a, a giant public deal about it. We're not advertising, but come, and, and kids especially, come, bring your friends. And, and so we're looking forward to that. We're, do, we're doing this um, so that you can really have a good time. Going to have uh, tailgating stuff beforehand. and so Because we do nothing meaningful unless we eat. We don't even have rock concerts unless we eat, right? So that's just the way that is going to go. So take note of that. 7 o'clock is the concert, September 26th. Jody Rolf has uh, details and so forth for that. If you are interested in becoming a member of Lewis Lake, um, we're delighted uh, that that would be the case. And uh, Pastor Bob does a class every so often called Lewis Lake 101, sort of introduce you to the church and uh, the denomination and so forth. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, there's a sign-up sheet back there for that as well. And so uh, we would appreciate that. Um, let me see. A few other things, but I'll just sort of... We'll talk about those later. Tonight, 6.30, uh, we're going to tackle the book of Joel. And so that'll be fun. I encourage you to come back for that. All right. Let us move into the worship of our Lord Jesus this morning. Tell you what, let's stand together. We're going to sing in a moment. And uh, let's do our call to worship together. Call each other to worship. Here we go. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Wonderful verse. Looking forward to uh, diving into the book of Ecclesiastes this morning. I can't wait. I tried to talk Pastor Bob into doing Song of Solomon. He was like, no, not going to do that. So we'll do Ecclesiastes. It's sort of a compromise for us. So anyway, uh, come thou almighty king. And Lord Jesus, we look forward to your return. We pray that it would be soon. We pray that you would sustain us in this hour and lord may it be a glad hour for we are your children thank you for the privilege that is ours to gather together and worship you and may our worship be acceptable and pleasing in your sight for we are yours by your calling by your grace what a privilege is ours to be your children and we marvel in it this morning in jesus name amen Thank you so much. You may be seated. We will turn our attention now to the reading of the Word of God from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. And this is the inspired, inerrant, unfailing Word of God, which will stand forever. Hear it. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, 
and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for, and this is such a marvelous phrase right here, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Aren't you? I am. <laughs> New heavens, new earth, in which righteousness dwells. This is the word of God, and it is a feast for our souls. We love the word of God here. We, we live in a terribly confusing age. It is hard to find truth and to even know it when you find it. And so we treasure highly the word of God that we can always trust to be true because it has been given to us from God and guides the people of God through difficult and murky times and has since he has given it to us. And so we are thankful for it. And we are thankful for those whose, whose task, whose mission is to make the word of God available to those who are lost. And uh, so we're thankful for the Gideons. We're thankful for Jim Kozlowski, is a friend of Lewis Lake here and a friend of mine. I consider him a friend of mine. I always enjoy visiting with him every time he comes. And so he's here to represent the Gideons, and he's going to come in a moment. We're gonna... well, praise God for that, huh? We hear testimonies like that a lot. And um, that one happened about six years ago. And it's just exciting. I wanted to share that with you just to give you an idea. As Gideons, when we're out, um, we go in places like parks. Uh, soon, hopefully, uh, we'll be doing university distributions. St. Cloud is usually towards the end of September. Uh, then the university down to Minneapolis, which takes a lot of manpower. But those are fun because you, you're standing on the corners and you're handing out testaments. Some students will actually stop and engage in a discussion. And, and those are the opportune times you have in order to talk about Jesus with them. I had one gentleman St. Cloud, I'm passing out. If you're familiar with St. Cloud on University Avenue, there's a bridge that goes over. And I plant myself on one end, and we've got Gideons that go on the other end. And uh, they have to go by you, because they, that's the only place from the bus stop to the university. That's where they have to go. And so we have them a little bit trapped. But I'm passing these out. And kids on bicycles, skateboards, I mean, they're grabbing them as fast as you, you're putting it out there, and they're grabbing them on the run. So you don't really have time for those. But I had one gentleman, and he wasn't a local, my guess, Middle Eastern some, somewhere, and he came by and asked, I says, would you like a copy of God's Word? And he says, no, I don't need that, and he walked, and he took about six steps, and he turned around, and he came back and asked me for one, because I, I forgot to tell you, as he walked away, I said, are you sure? And he took those six steps, and he turned around and came back and asked me for one. And he just took it, we didn't discuss anything, but I just wonder, is it just me asking him, are you sure? It, did it make him wonder in six steps? Maybe I might need that. So uh, God's word's powerful. And uh, I pray for that guy. I've never seen him since. But I pray for him, you know, every opportunity that I have as we're praying that God's word penetrated his heart, that he opened it up, and it does not return void. So... Uh, Anyway, it's testimonies like that that energize us and that will keep us going. And uh, we have opportunities. This year, it's been a little limited. We have not had our fairs. We haven't had the county fairs, the state fair, anything really in order to normally do our distributions. And so be in prayer for, you know, as a Gideon work, that more doors open up so that we can do it. They are going out around the world. 
One of the things that we have as a Gideon ministry is that we don't travel around the world to do the distributions. We have Gideons in all those countries. So they're not like the American Gideons going over to these countries to do it. They're already there. So that makes it a little bit easier. And it's through those distributions that you guys become part of it. Because without the churches that we speak to and the funds that come in from it, that's, where the, that's what prints those little testaments that we hand out. So you're part of what goes on there, and we appreciate you for that. I want to share a core scripture for the Gideon ministry. It's Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So you might ask, how can you help? Other than the funds, that's not my purpose here. But my purpose is prayer. All of us need to be praying, probably more now than ever. Um, you know, our churches, our leaders, our country. But I'm asking for prayer for the Gideon ministry as well, just so that we can keep moving forward. We need prayer. We'd be praying for men and their wives to join the Gideon ministry. We've got a lot of work to do. More hands make light work. And it's, it's fun. So if you're interested in it, I've got a little brochure I can give you. And you can take that home and check out the Gideon ministry. And then the opportunity that we have also to uh, be praying for those that receive God's word. Every person that takes it has that opportunity to open it up. And we just ask and pray that it is affecting their heart and, and their mind. And sometimes somebody will take a testament from us. And a fair is a great example. And all of a sudden, we are walking around the fair, and you see a testament just laying there on a table. Somebody took it from us, and they just set it on a table because they didn't want to carry it around. But we hear testimonies where somebody picks that up, and, they, and it still changes their life. I got a testimony of a lady who had a, a Bible, a Gideon Bible, like I'm using this morning, and it's almost twice as thick because she has paged through it so many times it's all swollen up. She dug that out of a dumpster. And she, was, she refused to give, get rid of it because God told her that was her answer to her problems. And so, uh, yeah, God's word goes forth. The other ways that you can help us is our Gideon Bible card program. The rack is full back there. I even put a couple birthday cards in there because we don't normally have birthday cards. So uh, use our cards. Every time that somebody uses this card, you know, and they put $5 in the envelope, you give the person the card, there is a Bible or several testaments purchased in honor or memory of that person that you bought the card for. Or not bought the card, but took the card for it and then gave the Gideons a $5 bill for it. And you can give more than $5. It's, that's not limited. So you can, you can give more. So that's a great way to fund this ministry. Um, the other thing that you can do with, uh, with it is become a friend of the Gideons. There's pamphlets. This is the only one I have today, so don't everybody mug me afterwards trying to get this one. But if you want it, you can have it. It's called the Gideons, Friends of the Gideons. And there's a one way that if you um, want to be a prayer friend, all you do is sign up. You will have prayer needs sent to you by email so that you can effectively pray for the Gideon ministry. And then you can also be a financial friend, and that's about $120 a year. You actually get 20 of the little testaments, and you can buy as many more as you want to use those for witnessing. So it's a, it's a great opportunity, but a friend of the Gideons is a great thing. And then today also, there are bulletins. If you didn't get one, yours might look a little different than the one that I have here. But if you didn't get one, they're back on the tables where you came in. And in there is an envelope. You can certainly use that envelope to send in an offering or a gift to the Gideon ministry at any time. So um, there's a, I want to share a quick testimony with you real quick. My name is Abdul. I was born in northern Ghana. My father was a Muslim spiritualist, and I was initiated in that religion. I dropped out of school at an early age, fell with a bad group, became an armed robber, and in 1984, we robbed the bank in Kamazi, and I was arrested and jailed for life. I was considered a dangerous person, and the authorities kept transferring me from prison to prison. One day, the group, a group came to our prison and gave out Bibles. 
I decided to use the pages of the Bible to wrap the marijuana packages I would sell to my customers. The pages of the Bible were just perfect. I later discovered it was a Gideon Bible. A prison inmate who had converted to Christianity warned me to stop my wicked act, and he told, I told him to mind his own business. And a few days later, a dream, somebody like an angel, warned me to turn from my wicked ways. It was against the laws of Ghana to do drugs, and it's more serious to sell drugs in prison. The minimum sentence for somebody caught in a drug-related case within prison yard is 10 years. A Christian inmate interpreted the dream to mean that Jesus wanted me to repent from my sinful ways. That night I could not sleep, and in the morning I packed all my drugs and gave them to the commander of the prison. That was a dangerous thing to do. However, I didn't care. I'm already spending my entire life in here. I gave my life to Jesus and started studying the Bible. Four months and 11 days after my first dream, the president of Ghana was leaving office and released some prisoners who had demonstrated good behavior. I came back home. He was discharged and set free. I came back home and I needed to find a job. I joined a security company and my first duty post was the bank I robbed. God's got a sense of humor. The bank keeps the keys in the police station and when we close in the evening, I was given the keys in order to get them to the police. I asked myself, what's wrong with this bank? I was jailed for stealing from this bank and they still give me the keys. They must be crazy. So uh, I, will still work at, I still work at the bank and also evangelize to unbelievers in Kamazi. To God be the glory. So it's fun little stories like that, which it's just, uh, I love seeing how God works in humorous ways. So God bless you all. It's great to see you. Um, I'm wearing my mask in my pocket. And uh, it is crazy times, Joe. And, uh, but prayer, prayer covers it all. So God bless. Talk to me afterwards if you need to. I just want to take a moment to marvel on the goodness of God. Um, I know back in March when things were being shut down, the, there was a mad rush among certain churches to get their hands on some money from the government. There was a great fear that the budgets would dry up and uh, ministry would shrivel and shrink. And if uh, we're not in the house of God and we're not sticking a plate in front of you, you're not going to contribute. Um, that has not been the case here. That has not been the case among you. God has been faithful. You have been incredibly generous. And uh, that just, I, I hate money. I hate asking for money. I hate talking about it. I, I wish it did not exist. Um, this makes me feel really weird. But y you've been wonderful. And I, and I commend you for the way that you have continued to worship God uh, by investing in the ministry of, of the church. So we're, we're so thankful for that. We're going to pray here in a moment, and uh, we're going to pray for, for Gordy, who is, uh, as the saying goes, nearing the shore. And uh, so make sure that you touch base with Gordy, let him know that you're thinking about him, love him, go visit him if you get a chance. And um, one of the great uh, gifts of God to this congregation is faithful old saints, and so make sure that you uh, touch base with Gordy if you get a chance. We want to continue to pray for a little Chloe. Uh, Peterson, uh, who's on the other end of life and facing just as significant of struggles. And so we want to pray for her. We want to pray for uh, Wendy's daughter-in-law, Wendy Ackerman's daughter-in-law, and Thomas's mom, Lisa. I, I love when Thomas is here. He's just great. If, you, if you're preaching away and you ask a question, Thomas answers it. And I love that. It's just phenomenal. Uh, but Lisa is down in the university a hospital and they're trying to figure out what's going on there and and so we want to pray for for Lisa and for God's mercy to her we want to pray for Nancy Naglich many of you know Nancy and she has uh, four broken bones right now femur collarbone and a couple of ribs and um, I, I understand she broke a leg rolling over in bed so that's kind of the situation that that she's in so we want to pray for Nancy as well our college kids are getting ready to shove off um, and so we want to pray for their parents um, and, and the kids as well. So, all right. So let's just take a moment and, and sort of gather all these things and present them before the Lord. Lord, you 
our dwelling place. You are our refuge. Your name is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it, and they are safe. And yet, Lord, we know that even as you hold us fast, even as you are our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble, you allow us to endure trouble and you allow those that we love so dearly to endure such trouble. And so we simply come to you this morning. We've expressed our concerns for these that we love. And, and, and we lay them before you. We ask for you to do for these dear ones what we can't do, that you administer to their hearts, give comfort to their souls, give hope. Lord, we would love to see you reach down and touch the bodies of little babies and bring them to health. We ask that you would reach into medical mysteries that we don't understand and set things straight. Lord, we especially pray for Gordy as he approaches the presence of the Lord Jesus. As his walk of faith is nearing the end, that you would hold him fast for these final steps. Lord, we look forward to hearing your word as we open this marvelous book. Send your spirit ministering through Pastor Bob to lead us into truth. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we uh, have an opportunity to do something different today, and that is to turn our Bibles not to Matthew, but to find that strange little book sort of in the middle of your Bible uh, after Proverbs and uh, so forth, Ecclesiastes. And uh, as we do so, we want to recognize we're launching into something quite different than what Matthew was as far as the kind of information we're receiving. So be ready for that. And uh, let me begin by uh, just talking about America for a little moment. America is a wonderful place, uh, even now, and uh, it's the place where we have life, liberty, and what? Pursuit of happiness. Good job. You passed the citizenship test there. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I guess the idea is that I need to have enough life in me, enough energy, enough health, and I need to have enough liberty, that is freedom, so that I can pursue happiness. That I can go after it and I can take hold of what makes me happy in life. Happiness uh, in our modern world today is understood a little bit differently than happiness has been understood in the past. Today, happiness is usually seen primarily in terms of the pursuit of pleasure, I'll, I'll use that word, pleasure. Um, the experience of pleasure, seeking it and experiencing pleasure is, has one of those ism words to describe it. It's called hedonism, hedonism, uh, simply the, the experience of pleasure in the secular world, not necessarily a spiritual thing, although John Piper has sought to make it that, but uh, in, in the common secular understanding, the pursuit of happiness means the pursuit of pleasure. Well, what kind of pleasure? Well, all kinds of pleasure, food and drink. Uh, when, when, uh, when the waitress comes and brings you your meal, what does she say? Does she say, here, eat this, It'll keep you alive till tomorrow, or at least till supper. No, she doesn't say that. What does she say? Enjoy. Enjoy. So food and drink and play, 
game, you know, athletics and uh, recreational kinds of things. What do they call that place where they sell those little tin boxes that people pull around and behind their pickups and, and live in instead of their nice homes? Well, what is the place called that sells that? Pleasure land. Pleasure land. See, it's ple the idea is pleasure. And you could maybe add re uh, relationships into that, though relationships are not limited to that, but some people pursue relationships primarily for pleasure. R.C. Sproul, no longer with us, he uh, made this statement about hedonism, about the pursuit of pleasure. He said, hedonism leads to two things, one of two things, and maybe both. Uh, boredom, first of all, or secondly, frustration. Boredom or frustration. That's, if you go out there and really try to have a lot of fun in the secular world, eventually you're going to get bored. And you're going to have to find something new to do, something different. Or if you can't pull it off, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to get mad. You're going to get angry because you tried to have fun and it didn't work or you don't have enough money to do the kinds of fun things you want to do or whatever it is. Boredom or frustration. And so this is the odd, backwards kind of thing about happiness is that the people who seem to be the most devoted to pleasure are the ones who often are the most unhappy. Last uh, Sunday after church, Sandy and I jumped in the car and we're driving north. We were going to Walker. By the way, uh, some, many of you have been praying for uh, my... Sister-in-law, Myrna DeYoung, she was dying of cancer up in Walker. She did pass away. We went up to sit with the family last Sunday. And as we were going north, who was coming south? People pursuing pleasure. <laughs> they did not look like they had had that good of a time. <laughs> Especially on the north side of uh, Brainerd, or Baxter properly, where somebody didn't quite get stopped quick enough before they met the car that was already stopped in big traffic jam. And then all the people backed up behind them for about a mile. They weren't too happy either. And so uh, I don't know what they were doing up there to have fun, but I don't think it worked. I don't think it worked. And that's the dilemma, the challenge of the pursuit of happiness in our world is that it can be a, a very difficult thing. It leaves us bored. We get tired of it after a while or it leaves us frustrated. So the question remains, can uh, happiness, real happiness, be had in this world in which we live today in a worldly sense? And the writer uh, of uh, Ecclesiastes, we'll call him Solomon, he gives it his best shot to go out and find all the pleasure he can get. He is unlimited by lack of money. He has all the money he needs. He's unlimited by the amount of time he can spend on it. He has all the time he needs. And he has energy and he goes out and just tries every single thing you could think of to have a good time. And then he comes back and gives the report. And that report is the book of Ecclesiastes. So understand the book in that way. Uh, here in the book of Cle Ecclesiastes, we have the report of somebody who pursued pleasure beyond what you and I are able to do. Let's look at the uh, book just for a moment as we dig into it. First of all, this is a really weird book. Very different, very strange. The name of the book, Ecclesiastes, well, uh, let me introduce that with verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. All right, so, so he is the preacher. And uh, we, we are, have a lot of questions about this book. 
The name of the book comes from the opening line, The Preacher, and it's a little bit weird, but the Hebrew word for preacher is uh, here is koholet, uh, and um, so he's the preacher. Now, whenever you have a preacher, you have a congregation. At least that's helpful for us preachers. When we were recording our services, and by the way, uh, welcome to our online audience. I didn't say that at the beginning, but we're glad that you're with us. I don't know if you're a week behind or if you're watching this on Monday, but anyway, welcome. We're glad that you guys are here. And the preacher has a, a congregation, of course. When you preach, you're preaching to somebody. And the Greek word for congregation is ekklesia, and therefore, the people in the ancient world started calling this book Ecclesiastes out of the Greek word ekklesia later on because there's a preacher in a congregation. This is a sermon going on. I know it doesn't really make sense to me either, but uh, anyway, that's, that's where the title sort of comes from. There are some questions about this book. We're not sure who wrote it. As, as Clark said, we, we, uh, many conservative scholars believe that Solomon wrote it. Kind of makes sense. He's the son of David, king of Jerusalem, unless he's just saying that to trick us. There are a lot of scholars who believe that it's written much later and, and so forth. So we're not sure who wrote it, but we're, we'll assume it's Solomon. Uh, we're not sure when it was written. We're not sure if it was written. If Solomon wrote it, well, then we know exactly when it was written. But if he didn't, then it could be anywhere between Solomon and the, the birth of Jesus Christ almost. Well, it couldn't be that. But anyway, we're not sure. We're not sure, we're not sure if it has a structure. Is, is there some kind of skeletal structure in this book? Some scholars say, oh, yes, there is. And others say, no, nah, it's... Just a bunch of different stuff all thrown together. We're not completely sure how to interpret it. There, what, what is the point? If you, if you say, what is the theme, which I will explain to you in a minute, what is the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes, and you start reading the commentaries, you will find as many answers almost as there are commentaries. So there's not any agreement there. And finally... Uh, we're not even sure, some are not even sure, rather, whether, whether it should even be in the Bible. Because it says things that almost seem to disagree with other parts of the Bible, or it, it espouses things that almost seem to be bad theology. So, uh, should this even be in the Bible? Well, we're, we're saying, yeah, we, we think it should, but not everybody agrees with that. The theme of Ecclesiastes is this, and this is what I'm going with. The necessity of fearing God in a fallen and therefore frequently confusing and frustrating world. This world doesn't make sense always. This world doesn't work like we think it should. This world can leave you empty and so forth. And so because of all of this craziness in our world, it is really important to fear God and to follow him. That's basically what the book of Ecclesiastes is telling us. E Ecclesiastes could be seen as a report on the failed quest for eternal life. And I don't mean eternal life in the sense of dying and going to heaven and living forever. I mean eternal life in the sense of life on a higher plane, Life beyond mere existence. Life beyond just getting enough food to eat to stay alive till tomorrow. But a higher plane of existence. An existence that has happiness. So with that much of a head start, let's kind of dive into the first few verses here. Uh, in verse 2, the writer makes this basic start in the book of Ecclesiastes about life. He says... Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. A word about the word vanity. <laughs> there are a couple of different meanings of vanity. When, when somebody is vain, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that they're kind of obsessed with themselves, right? 
They're vain. Uh, Carol, was it Carol King who had the famous song back in the 70s? You're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. <laughs> she made a lot of mileage off that little turn of phrase there, didn't she? You're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. And uh, Alicia, thinking a little bit on that one. Uh, that's one idea of vanity, but there's another major meaning of the word vanity, which has to do with being useless or futile. We use this meaning when we say, I did that all in vain. What I did was in vain. It, it didn't, you know, I, I spent all this time working on that and it was all for nothing. It was all in vain. So that's the kind of meaning that we're using when we think of the word vanity here. So when you think about a hurricane coming, the Iowa just had that big, uh, and, and Chicago, what was that storm called? They had a name for it. It started with a D. What's that? Yeah, direct, direct, direct that thing. Anyway. <laughs> so, so here comes a storm, a hurricane-level storm, and I need to protect myself, so I'm going to put up my little pup tent and get in there, and I'll be safe, right? That would be vanity. That would be futility. That would be useless. That's the idea. There are 12 words in the English language Bible here in verse 2, 12 words, and five of them are vanity. That's, that's vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He just keeps using the word vanity over and over again. And the idea is that everything in all of life, and this is the bad news, I hope you didn't come here today depressed or discouraged. I'm not going to do much for you here today. <laughs> but we have to talk about something that's true, and maybe it'll, it'll explain your depression. Everything in all of life is useless, futile, and vain. That's what the richest guy the most powerful guy, the most creative guy in the world, in world history, that's how he found life to be. Well, that's pretty negative, huh? <clears throat> Doesn't give much hope to people living today. We who live in the land of the pursuit of happiness, it's useless. Why even do it? whatever it is that we do. And then the writer goes on and he said, well, let me give you a few examples of what I mean. Let me talk about what I mean by everything is useless and vain. The next several verses go on to illustrate why this guy thinks everything is so useless and futile in the world. Verse 3, what does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? So look at your jobs. Look at what you do for a living. Look at, at the things you try to accomplish, your projects and so forth. Um, what do you gain by that? What do you really get out of it? A man retires with a big nest egg. He, <clears throat> he works hard all his life, saves his money, and he's... He's looking forward to that pursuit of happiness in retirement. The, the American version of retirement is forever lasting vacation. And he's just right there, but then at the age of 67, he dies of a heart attack. Or as the former conference superintendent Paul Erickson experienced when he retired, uh, he retired, moved down to Florida, was riding his bicycle, got into a little bang with a vehicle, tipped over, head injury, vegetable in the nursing home. First, that, that was his first summer of, of retirement. See? Useless. Vanity. Futility. There's no use. That's the kind of stuff that happens to people. John and Muriel work hard to 
create a beautiful yard. And in a moment, the tornado comes down and blows the whole thing up. What do we do all that for? It was in vain. It was useless. Verses 4 to 5, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. That's an interesting couple of verses because the idea is that life comes into existence and then it's gone and the sun just keeps getting up the next day no matter what happens on the earth. Ernest Hemingway wrote a novel and the title for that novel comes out of this verse. That novel was The Sun Also Rises. That book that Hemingway wrote is, is all about post-World War I and the fact that that, that war created uh, injury and devastation upon mankind and upon the society to a level that had never been seen before and now people are coming off of World War I and they're just trying to somehow limp forward into the future and, and uh, here's this group of people and they go down, they like the bullfighting in Spain and they go down there and they're all wrapped up in competing pursuit of happiness in relationships between them and jealousies and, and so forth and the whole point of the, the book is this, that here we are, we're, we're trying to stumble on with our lives. It doesn't even seem like the universe cares. The sun gets up in the morning, the sun goes down at night, just round and round, and nothing ever changes. The universe seems indifferent to our sorrows and what goes on in our lives. Verses 6 and 7, the wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. In those verses, the writer is saying life just seems to go round and round in never-ending circles of activity. The same thing over and over again. The wind it's the same thing over and over again. The streams, the writer said, I don't get it. The rivers keep flowing into the ocean, but the ocean never gets full, never overflows. The rain falls and back up and down, and just round and round and round. And the writer looks at that and says, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't get us any place. Tomorrow we end up pretty much in the same place we were yesterday. In verse 8, the writer says, All streams run to the sea, but the sea... Oh, I'm sorry, verse 8. All things are full of weariness, and a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. In verse 8, he says, Everything is full of weariness. It'll wear you out. We see things, but we're not satisfied. If you go out and see a great sight, it's kind of cool for a while, but it usually just means you want to go out and see an even greater sight soon. <laughs> All of this stuff only leaves us wanting more, something greater yet. We hear things, but we are not satisfied. We, we want more. It just leaves us hungry for more. Mankind is pushed deeper and deeper into a pursuit of happiness that never really satisfies. It just leaves you to the point where you, want to, you have to go and do it more. You have to go do it again. If I, jump, if I uh, jump my bike over the driveway, I immediately, I'm not happy with that. Instead, Pretty soon I'm into extreme sports where I'm jumping my Harley Davidson over the Grand Canyon. You know, I mean, <laughs> this, is where, this is where it leads. 
Verses, uh, oh, and that's, that's why he declares that all these things are full of weariness. They just wear you out. You do them, but it never really, uh, see us, do I have time? No, I don't have time, sorry. Okay, forget that. Um, verses 9 through 10, uh, what, uh, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It's, all, it's been already in the ages before us. So the writer said, you can't do anything that somebody hasn't already thought of and done. Talk to one guy, he wanted to have a house on a lake or on a river. And he was absolutely shocked to discover that all the building sites on lakes and rivers were already full of houses. <laughs> If you've had the idea, somebody has probably already had that idea before you, right? Um, did you know that it is virtually impossible to come up with a new heresy in the church? A new wrong thinking? A new doctrine that's false? I asked Job this, I said, am I right about this? Every error and every mistake that you could ever make when thinking about God or thinking about people under God has already been made and probably was made by the year 400. You cannot go wrong in any significantly new way. And so the Jehovah's Witnesses followed their, their direction and they, they thought it was something fresh and then it turns out it's, it's simply ancient Arianism recycled in a modern way. You see, any mistake you can make today has already been done. There is nothing new under the sun. Today we think that because we have cell phones and laboratories, we are different. But the fact is, we simply go wrong in the same old way as everyone did before us, they rode a chariot on the way to their mistake. We drive a car. That's the only difference. Verse 11, the last verse we're going to look at says, There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to be among those who come after. In other words, you're going to be forgotten. What you do is not going to be remembered the, uh, <laughs> the sad truth is, well, let, let me ask you to do this experiment. Um, who was your ancestor living in the year 1825? Any idea? I have no idea. There might be a few rare souls out there, but for the most part, people, your descendants that were living in the early 1800s, no, you have no idea who they are. They are forgotten and they are gone. 150 years from today, no one will know you lived. No one will remember your name. Lost and forgotten. There is no remembrance even, even famous people like Columbus and General Robert E. Lee are being canceled today. They don't want us to remember them either. All of these situations and realities are illustrations of the basic truth of life in this world that ours is a life of vanity, futility, and uselessness. So, after that wonderful little start, that's amazing anybody reads the whole book of Ecclesiastes, isn't it? <laughs> after that beautiful start, it doesn't really draw you in, you know. It doesn't leave you saying, boy, I want to read the rest of this book. What do we, what do, we do with that? Well, the first, what we need to do with that is come to terms with it. 
The Bible isn't being overly negative, but it does want us to come to terms with this. And in my last few minutes, let me try to go quickly here and I'll talk about how do you, what, what, what do I mean, coming to terms with vanity? The, there's a truth here that we need to remember, and it's this. The writer is talking about life now in this fallen, sin-cursed world. And he's talking about secular life, apart from God. And so this is, this is the life he's talking about. God originally made life to be fulfilling and wonderful and useful and had a point. That's how we were created. That's how God created the world. But when sin came in, all of that meaningful stuff went out the window to a great extent. Someday... Jesus will return. I hope you caught that with the scripture reading and with the call to worship and all that. See, this is why we're waiting for a different world. Someday Jesus is going to come and he's going to bring us into a new world, a new heavens and a new earth, and all of the stuff that we long for in that pursuit of happiness, meaning, not vanity kind of thing, is going to come back into our existence and we are going to experience it to the full. But until that time, we are now called to come to terms with life as it is in the here and now. And how is it now? Vanity and futility. Coming to terms with it means realizing that complete happiness is not possible in this world. Remember Sproul. Sproul agrees with Solomon when he says, Hedonism leads to boredom and frustration. People are angry today, aren't they? People are angry today, and, and one of the basic core reasons why they're so angry is because they have done what they thought you had to do to find happiness, and they have not found it. And when you do what you think you need to do to be happy, and you end up not being happy, that just can be so frustrating, so angering, so maddening. I thought this thing was going to do it for me. But I'm still not happy. And that's exactly what Ecclesiastes said is going to happen. If I go out and buy a brand new motorcycle, yeah, it's pretty cool for a while. But eventually, <laughs> I find out, well, it isn't quite as cool as I thought it was going to be. This is wrong, and that's not happening, and this doesn't work quite the way I thought. And I, I, we went out riding, and... But do I feel any different? No. So coming to terms means realizing that. means looking at life and saying, is this a place where I can be totally happy and, and have a great super-duper Facebook kind of life? If you say yes, good luck. It's boredom and frustration for you. But if you say, no, this life doesn't offer that. I can't really get that thing that I'm after. That, that huge flow of traffic on Friday nights <laughs> really isn't going to make it happen for me. As we read this book, we are going to find out that it does affirm, it does affirm the simple pleasures of life. So there is hope. So hang in there. Come back next week, I promise. Maybe, well, come back in the next few weeks. <laughs> uh, it will show us the way to find some happiness in this world, the kind of happiness that's available to us. 
But until that time, this vanity element is also in very great measure in our lives. Have you found life to be disheartening, difficult, and downright depressing at times? Don't worry. Nothing is wrong. That's exactly how life is. Are you depressed? It's depressing. Are you discouraged? It's discouraging here. If, if I'm living in a depressing world and I don't get depressed, people are going to say, you've got a problem, buddy. You need to get in touch with reality. If you're not happy, it's an accurate read on this world. So I give you permission to be unhappy and to be discouraged. It's okay. I know they out there say it's not okay. They're trying very hard to find meaning and joy in this world because if they don't have God, this world is all you have. And the thought of not having any happiness here is just beyond accepting. We live in a fallen world, and, and it, therefore this world is frequently frustrating, and it is frequently confusing. It's going to leave us questioning, what in the world? That's normal. But you and I have a hope. A confident expectation that we are steadily moving forward to happiness. That's where we're going. We're on the way. God is bringing us there. And this happiness is not something you have to pursue. For it is something that our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, gives to us as a free gift. That's why the Bible says, if you want to have a great life, you want to save your life, you want to have joy in life, quit trying to have a happy, great, joyful life. Instead, lose yourself in the person of Jesus Christ. Give yourself completely to Christ and forget about chasing after the happy life and joy will come to you from Him. For this is something that our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, wants to give to you. This is the joy that gives us the strength to carry on in a world that is vanity and futility. So like I said, uh, we're just starting with Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is going to come to you and say, Sit down and enjoy that hamburger, that cup of coffee. Smile when your grandkids are around. And just enjoy the simple pleasures of life. They're here. God is blessing us. But it's still vanity, ultimately. And it will be until the day of Jesus Christ. And that is is the thing we have put our hope on completely. Let us pray. Father, we know that you created us for life. And we know that you are the life. And we know that we have been filled with new life by the touch of your hand. And yet, Father, we recognize these truths that the preacher discovered. So help us to come to terms with that and to not demand happiness every moment, but simply to lose ourselves in you. We thank you and praise you for the joy that you have set before us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.